political consultant Jay McCluskey is, depending on who you talk to, one of the most revered or feared people in state politics. He has the ear of Governor Susana Martinez and is fresh off running tough campaigns through his reform New Mexico Now PAC against some of the state's legislature's biggest names. Here's NMIF producer Matt Grubbs. Jay, thanks for coming in. We appreciate your time. You bet. So tell me, in this last election, on, on a state legislative um, level, where are you hanging your hat? Well, I think overall, you know, we're obviously when you lose nationally as Republicans did and, and we have tough nights at the top of the ticket, that's going to translate down to uh, down ballot races. So, you know, we thought we had a shot at the House. We thought it was probably an outside shot given a presidential year. But we're happy that we won three uh, state Senate seats um, in the state. We also knocked off two of the three Senate Democratic leaders, which we thought was a good night. And we're happy that we looks like we defended six of the eight Republican um, Republican seats that we won in 2010. We also picked up a seat up in uh, northwestern uh, New Mexico. The Ray Begay seat. Ray yeah. Begay seat was a previously Democrat seat. We also picked up a new seat out of re from redistricting that was also a Democratic seat in the past with Monica Youngblood. So overall, it looks like we're going to be down one or down two in the House. And that's actually more Republican seats than we've ever had following a presidential election year since like 1967. So it's not as good as we would have liked. Obviously, we, were, we would have liked to have won control, but all things factored in, it's, it was a, uh, you know, we're satisfied with the results. As people sort of game out what happened in the election, of course, it's always uh, difficult. But the criticism I hear most often, at least right now, is that you guys didn't play hard enough in the House. Would you agree with that? Oh, I totally disagree. Really? I mean, I, I think we, we invested more in House races than has ever been invested in the state in, on the Republican side by leaps and bounds. And so we fought really hard for the House. Uh, the Democrats did as well. And, and you know, you got to give the other side credit. They won at the top of the ticket and they, they, they were able to run a very effective turnout operation that, that carried their legislative candidates with them. You got to give the other side credit. Sure. Uh, the lack of a straight party option, Republicans were, to my knowledge, really hoping that that would give them two, three, four points, something mm -hmm. like that. Did it give you the bump that you thought? I don't think it translated at all. You know, I think there was a lot of talk about that. And I was always cautious with people that that's a theory, that it was going to help us. And that didn't translate on Election Day at all that we could see. That was um, Democrats actually voted a pretty straight ticket without that, that option. And we didn't get nearly the crossover vote that we needed uh, up and down the ticket. What do you think happened in House 53 with, with Ricky Little? Um, as, as people look at that district, um, I've heard a lot of them say, I, I just can't figure it out. Because performance-wise, it would seem to lean toward you. Yes, I think if you got to look at Doniana County as a whole, I think as from, a, from our perspective, from a Republican perspective, no Republican carried Doniana County. And that includes Steve Pierce, who, was run, who won t by 20 points district-wide. Uh, I believe Heather Wilson lost by 20 points. Uh, uh, Mitt Romney lost big, and we did not have a single Republican carry that county. When you look at the little race, I think there's a large Hispanic population there. I think this is a problem that we had, we saw with the presidential race, where Republicans were underperforming with uh, Hispanic voters, and I think that translated into that uh, District 53 race. And so you're looking at a performance average that's, you know, the last 10 years or so, and that district's been growing. And you had like Chaparral was in that district. There were very long lines in Chaparral, people voting, a high turnout there. And I think that the top of the ticket there was very uh, Democrat. And that vote obviously cost uh, Rick Little a seat. Sure. As, as you look, let's step outside of the state uh, level for a while. Um, as you look at that Hispanic vote that you mentioned, that was mm -hmm. something that George W. De George w. Bush did a great job of. He, he got those votes. He got what he needed. Mm -hmm. That's fallen off, John McCain, and, and now here in 2012 with Mitt Romney. What, what's behind that? I, I think Republicans have to do a better job uh, getting the Hispanic vote. It's, it's clear. Uh, George W. Bush did a good job and got 44% of the Hispanic vote, if you believe exit polling. It was obviously much higher than we've had, but you got, he had a track record. And this is something, when he was a governor of Texas, he mm -hmm. was... Um, very, he got a lot of Hispanic vote in Texas, and he, he was engaged with the community and committed to education reform. And that carried over when he was um, president, and both running for president and running for reelection. And I think the message there is Republican candidates, Republican office holders, can't visit Hispanics during an election season and think they're going to win the vote. You have to be 
sincere enough and authentic enough as a party, as, as an elected official, as a candidate, to be engaged with the community. And that's where, you know, the Republicans have not done a good enough job, obviously, and that's something that they're going to have to do better of. Uh, I've heard often uh, the criticism of people who say, quote, the Hispanic vote on either side as it's not necessarily this monolithic thing. They're responding to um, the same issues that many, many other people are, you know, whether it's family values issues, um, economic issues, things like that. Um, what would need to change in the Republican um, platform to appeal to those voters? I don't know that it's a necessarily a platform change. I think it's the party will always be defined, I think, by the candidates. And so we have to do a good job of recruiting candidates who are going to appeal to the Hispanic community um, overall. Uh, recruiting and electing more Hispanic um, candidates. And that's something Governor Martinez nationally was part of the Future Majority Project, which had a goal of recruiting 100 uh, Hispanic candidates to run for office throughout the country. And it, you look at our, some of our pickup seats, um, as far as we have a, a Navajo woman who won a House District 4 um, up there. Monica Youngblood is a Hispanic one, woman who won that other seat. And I think that's important for the party. It's good for the party, but it's, it's good for the state overall. It's good for the community to have um, representation in both parties. And I think that's something that the candidates and the elected officials have to do a better job of. Uh, let's get back into the into the state now and talk about the Senate. You guys, um, and you guys, when I say that, reform New Mexico now. Um, mm -hmm. You're running this pack and uh, played very hard in Senate 32 with Tim Jennings where he had mm -hmm. success and in Senate 29 with Michael Sanchez where he didn't. Let's start with Jennings okay. where you won. What made that work? Was it just the amount of money that was there? No, I mean, if you look at it, Tim Jennings out, you know, Tim Jennings, I believe, spent $350,000 on his race. He had outside um, PAC assistance from the Democrats. I think what cost uh, Senator Jennings, he was just out of step with his district. I mean, Cliff Pirtle better represented the district, and the issues highlighted that and demonstrated that. And I think that's what carried it. And also, there's a lot of, there's always a lot of talk about what the PACs did or what outside groups did. Well, you had someone, you know, like in, in Cliff Pirtle and Senator-elect Pirtle who, saying he knocked on, you know, was knocking doors every day. I mean, he met with a lot of voters, and so he had a lot to do with, with that victory. And I think what cost Senator Jennings was just being out of step with his constituents. Sure, but if you just look at, you know, knocking on doors, we wouldn't have spent, what is it, $6 billion in a mm -hmm. presidential race, that sort of thing. I mean, money really does matter, and that's, in fact, why you guys formed that group, right? Well, we, we clearly wanted to be able to communicate the message to the voters, and, and that's necessary. It's we even, uh, Senator Jennings went on TV, and we obviously had to go on TV as well. We'd be foolish not to, to, to give him that medium. Right. And so... I think that played a role, but it was his, you know, at the end of the day, when you have that much resources on both sides, voters get a pretty clear message from each side. And at the end of the day, I think Jennings' positions on those issues is what cost him the seat. Uh, and then the Michael Sanchez district, that was one where you look at the House mm -hmm. and Republicans had in House districts seven and eight, um, they held those districts, mm -hmm. um, the David Chavez and then uh, Alonzo Baldonado. Um, but when you play that out to Senate, 10-point victory for Michael Sanchez. Yeah, and it's not, the, the Senate district doesn't, com, is, isn't it's exact exactly. overlap. Sure, sure. Um, that district got more Democrat during redistricting, but at the end of the day, Senator Sanchez was able to carry it. It's a, um, he, they, I think he benefited from having the top of the ticket, but at the end of the day, he was able to convince the voters in that district to reelect him, and, and that's, that's the election. He, we talked to him on election night, and he mentioned actually your name, Gene. <laughs> and it, his criticism was, he said, the guys like Jay McCleskey are out there creating issues um, for elections. This is not an agenda for Governor Martinez. So I don't really see what her agenda is, what she wants to do, other than pick issues that we oppose and then pick us off in the next election. Talk about that. I, I totally disagree with him. There's a, take the issue of... Um, ensuring children can read by the third grade or social promotion. That is an issue where Governor Martinez and, and uh, President Obama's administration are in agreement on that issue. It's an, it's an issue that the Albuquerque Journal found that 75% of New Mexicans are in agreement on that issue. It passed the House with broad bipartisan support and passed Senate committees with broad bipartisan support. And Senator Sanchez chose not to call that bill up to let it to pass, to allow it to have an up or down vote. Now, that was a big issue during the campaign. And so the issues we brought up during the campaign to suggest that children reading by third grade isn't an important issue, um, I disagree with. I mean, he, we obviously had disagreements on that issue, and um, those were, that's what the campaign was, uh, you know, was, uh, had around. You 
picked issues um, in social promotion in um, the driver's license issue that, as you said, there there's heavy support for them. Mm -hmm. But are, is that support shallow? Do people care enough about that stuff to get to the polls? Is that what you saw in District 29 that people are like, yeah, social promotion, but I, I just don't buy into it. I know Michael Sanchez, he's my guy. No, I think there are a lot of issues that factor into what happens at the polls on election day, especially in a, in a presidential um, election year. I, I would bet that when you look at the canvas numbers on within that district, that Michael Sanchez was underperforming much of the Democratic ticket. And so I think there was a lot of crossover vote that happened on, on that issue. And you can see whether it's taxes and spending, whether it's the driver's license issue, whether it's education reform, I do think those issues matter to, uh, to voters. Um, the agenda that the governor will have um, come January, is it going to look similar to what we've seen? Is she going to keep uh, knocking on the same doors as far as social promotion? And that I think she's going to work hard still on education reform, on job creation, and whether that's uh, tax reform or job training or tying education into some of the job creation measures. But she's right now reaching out to Democratic legislators and, and crafting a lot of that that agenda to uh, be as bipartisan as possible. And, and I think you'll see a lot of the, her commitment to education reform will certainly be there. Her commitment to job creation will certainly be there. But you have a split government now. And, and you're going to, just as we did before, and I think you're going to see um, her working across the aisle quite a bit, as, as she's done in the past. You saw with the budget, you know, these we've had budget fights. You see it nationally. You see it in other states. In New Mexico, we've been able to pass budgets with broad bipartisan support that, you know, both sides have to compromise, but at the end, New Mexicans win. Sure. Uh, when you say she's reaching out to other people, it's a great soundbite, and it sounds good, but what does it mean? I mean, has she made a phone call to Michael Sanchez? I don't know. Would she's, he even take that call? No, I mean, she's always reached out to Michael Sanchez. She's reaching out to Democrat legislators, to, to the leadership on, on various issues and, and working to craft. I know she was speaking with Senator Wirth, for example, who's definitely on the left side of the um, political spectrum on issues like taxes and how they can work together on tax reform to put together a package. So Senate Bill 9 uh, stuff that happened last session. Senate, Senate Bill 9 and, and various issues and how okay. things can get wrapped into a larger overall um, tax reform. So she's always, she's always been willing to and able to and, and successfully reached across the aisle. There's, you look at the social promotion bill, for example, that, that was sponsored by a Democrat in the House and a Democrat in the Senate. And so these have been, many of her agenda items have been carried by Democrats. It'd be uh, very difficult to say they're partisan. Uh, you look at people who carried some of her bills, the driver's license bill in the House, mm -hmm. that was an Andy Nunez bill. Some people said it was an Andy Nunez bill before mm -hmm. it was the Susana Martinez bill. Um, it, all the same, you tried to get a Republican into that seat. Um, it, was that just a numbers game? Was there something else going on? No, I mean, I think Andy Nunez, when um, he chose to run as an independent, and, and not in either party, he basically uh, sealed his political fate. The reality is he was not going to win that district as an independent. He was never um, in a position to win that district. It was either going to be won by a Democrat or a Republican. And so we obviously backed the Republican to win that race. When Susana Martinez runs for re-election, um, presuming she runs for re-election, it's always up to her, mm -hmm. um, what's she going to run on? What's the message voters are going to hear? Well, I think you'll hear that she's, she did what she said she was going to do, and that's what she's continuing to do. There is nothing in her agenda right now that she's um, pushing or advocating or something she's done before that she did not campaign on. She was very honest and clear with voters about what she intended to do while in office, and she's, she's done that, and she's carried that out. And that doesn't mean she's gotten everything she's wanted to get done through the legislature, but she's always advocated um, that and been very straight with voters. Uh, as you look at... Um the economy and jobs. That's that's the one weak spot. It was for the president. Mm -hmm. um, it is for her because she's she's the governor right mm -hmm. now and she's got to do something. What is she going to do? Are there any specific measures out there? Oh, I think what you saw last session with what she did working on tax reforms, getting rid of the, the tax pyramiding or the double and triple taxation of goods and services, especially with uh, in the construction industry to try to jumpstart the economy. She was trying to remove taxes from some of the 30,000 um, small businesses and, and really helping small businesses. She's also looking at infrastructure projects. You see the Paseo del Norte I-25 interchange that was approved by the voters. That's something she was very strong on, not just for the jobs that it creates building the interchange, but also how that infrastructure helps um, helps the economy and small businesses. Also, she's also working on you know, job training and, and what we can do to help with job training efforts, as well as education reform and tying those into um, into job creation and, and helping small businesses that way. And I think you're going to see um, this session a, a strong focus on, on job creation measures. Jay, thanks for your time. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you.